Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 17th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I am your host, Steve Patterson, and today is going to be another interview breakdown. I'm going to do things a little bit differently this time. Usually, when I do an interview breakdown, I'll cover several interviews, but this time, I just want to cover one because I thought it was so good and I have so much to say. It was my most recent interview with Dr. Timothy Williamson at Oxford University. We're talking about the question, what is logic? You'll have to forgive. You can probably hear a little chirp in the background. That's because right now I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere, and the crickets are unbelievably loud. So you'll just have to act like this is philosophy in the wild. And before I start, I really want to give a special shout out and thank you to a few new Patreon supporters who are helping to make this show possible. They are actively helping to create a more rational worldview. That includes Kenneth Brown, Maggie, and Alex Timofeyev. Sorry if I ruined your name. If you enjoy these, you can also go to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson and help support the show. Okay, so let's talk about my favorite topic in the entire universe, logic. All right, so one of the first questions is, what is logic in the first place? You ask a lot of different people, you get lots of different answers, and I really liked his response here. From my point of view, as a philosopher, the the most uh, fundamental part of logic is really just concerned with very, very broad structural uh, generalizations about how things are. So it, it, it is just as much concerned with, with reality as, as any other kind of investigation, but just at this very abstract structural level. So I really like this answer. I think it's very accurate that when we're talking about logic, we're not just talking about the rules for reasoning or some arbitrary human convention. We're really trying to discover the most fundamental truths about the nature of reality itself. What I like to say is that logic is the rules of existence, which means that all existent things, by virtue of them being things, play by logical rules. These rules are something that aren't optional, they are inescapable, and that's what the study of logic is. And most people so far that I talk to aren't willing to take such a strong position, but I think Dr. Williamson's position on this is as close to my own worldview as anybody that I've spoken with. So naturally, the next follow-up question is to ask about whether or not there are different logics out there. If I have my logic, you have your logic, another culture has their own logic. And what you would expect is that if logic is something that has to do with the rules of all existence, then there would just be one ultimate logic out there. Historically, this idea that there are multiple logics out there has been called logical pluralism, which I asked Dr. Williamson if he's sympathetic to. I'm not a pluralist about logic. It seems to me that the uh, the questions, the, the most fundamental questions that we're, we're asking have have right and wrong answers. And if, if Two people are giving in- inconsistent answers to a question, then um, at least one of them is wrong. Now, again, I agree with this answer, but keep it in mind, because my own position is somewhat of a radical, aggressive one, where I so strongly agree with this that I'm willing to say if people claim that there are multiple logics, it is certainly the case that they're mistaken. I'm not just confident that there's only one logic. I would say I'm certain of it, and that's what the subject of my upcoming book, Square One, is going to be exactly about. And though Dr. Williamson is sympathetic to the idea, he certainly isn't willing to take as strong a stance that there is certainly one logic, as will be revealed as we go farther into this interview. And so I ask him about kind of the most popular modern philosophy that incorporates the existence of contradictions into their logic, and that's called dialetheism. Now, dialetheism, given the fact that it actively incorporates the existence of contradiction into its claims, I would say refutes itself and therefore is not a rational position to take. Here's what Dr. Williamson thinks. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm not a, di- a dialetheist. I, I think that uh, when somebody contradicts themselves, something is going, going wrong. Um, I think dialetheism, it's an, it's an interesting view because uh, it, it's not just a completely irrational sort of reaction. It, it's... Uh, it is a way of attempting to to deal with with certain kinds of paradoxes, which uh, result where apparently very plausible principles lead to contradictions. And, um, and the the dialetheist idea is that <laughs> those contradictions are really t- telling us something, and and that as we're in reality, there are there simply are 
if you like, black holes of, of contradiction. Now, this is really interesting to me because throughout this interview, he's very polite. Dr. Williamson is very polite, very respectful, very open-minded. But there's a saying that goes, it is essential to have an open mind, but not a mind so open that your brain falls out. Now, of course, I'm not implying that Dr. Williamson is stupid by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that intellectuals have to be honest. We have to be genuine that some ideas are good, some ideas are respectable, some ideas aren't. And I am not willing, just for the sake of politeness, to give this polish of respectability to a set of ideas that is certainly wrong and what I would say is ridiculous. Now, the list of ideas that I qualify as being utterly, patently, openly, self-evidently ridiculous is very small. Very, very small list. I'm willing to listen to the people who are considered uh, crazy by society standards. This is a true story. Several years ago, I was living in upstate New York, and every Sunday there was a guy that came out on the sidewalk with his own guitar, and he would sing songs every single Sunday about some r religious thing. Everybody can call them crazy. Well, I'm interested in those people. I, I would like to hear what they have to say. I find them interesting, and it's certainly possible that maybe they're right. And I talked to him at length at one point, and he had a little handout that he gave me, and his argument was essentially, look, I was in the bathtub one day, and an angel came and spoke to me and told me that actually in the Bible, everything's kind of backwards because the devil is actually Jesus, and Jesus is the devil, and therefore we need to change our theology accordingly. Well, I don't agree with his ideas, but I'm willing to at least take them seriously. I don't find them self-evidently, certainly false, right? It might be the case that this guy could be a prophet for all I know. Well, I listened to his argument. I wasn't persuaded by it, but at least it's possible. And how in all sincerity, I'm not exaggerating, I find the man on the street's arguments to be more plausible than dialetheism i.e. any worldview which actively incorporates logical contradictions, is certainly false and deserves no shred of intellectual respectability. It is aggressively anti-intellectual, so I am myself personally extremely open-minded, but not to the point where I'm willing to entertain this idea that somehow you could have a true contradiction. When you have a full, clear conception of what a contradiction is, you can have certainty that there could be no such thing as a true contradiction. Okay, so what's also interesting about his response is that he very clearly grasps the severity of what the dialetheists are claiming. He's saying that they're not just claiming con language is contradictory. The dialetheists are trying to tell us something about reality, that in reality you can have actually existent contradictions that you just kind of have to deal with. He calls them black holes. And my position is that's far too polite. What I would say is it's certainly not the case, unbeknownst to the dialetheist, that they can claim anything about reality because reality cannot be contradictory. So to the extent you think that something is and is not, at the same time, you don't understand the meaning of is or is not. These two things are certainly mutually exclusive, and to put them together is just revealing of your own conceptual confusion. Their, their view is that if you're willing to accept a few contradictions, you can actually get a, a, a nicer theory overall than, than if you avoid contradictions. But um, in, in all these cases, it is po in fact possible to avoid contradiction. So when that answer comes from a professor at Oxford University with a nice British accent, it sounds at least remotely respectable, right? Oh, well, the dialetheists claim that their vision, their understanding of reality is a little bit nicer if you incorporate contradictions than one where you don't incorporate contradic contradictions. And my position is, no, <laughs> it is certainly not the case that any claim that incorporates a logical contradiction can be somehow more palatable than a claim which does not incorporate a logical contradiction. I would say, in all sincerity, the guy on the street playing the guitar, singing about how Jesus is the devil because an angel told him while he was in the bathtub, is closer to truth than the dialetheist. It is the most base-level confusion that one can possibly have. To entertain the idea that there somehow could be a true contradiction, you literally could not be further away from the truth. It's a denial of the existence of truth.
It's a denial of the existence of reality. It's a denial of the importance of rationality and consistency. It is the furthest, most anti-intellectual position that one can take. But of course, if you are in the academic world and Grand Prix is somebody that you interact with and people are going to listen to this interview in your professional circles, you can't say that. You have to take a much more mild position. So my guess is that Dr. Williamson actually believes what he says. I don't think he's, uh, I don't think he's lying or just saying what is uh, expedient for his career. But I do sincerely think that the way that he and nearly every academic treats the supposed plausibility and respectability of arguments is mistaken. Now, if Graham Priest, who is kind of the creator of dialetheism, if he weren't a professional philosopher, if he was just some guy, some guy outside of academia, heaven forbid, and he were to make the claims that he makes, people would laugh at him, they would deride him, they would say, you are an anti-intellectual, there's no way you can possibly believe this, you're a fool. Uh, but because he's within the system now, we have to treat his ideas with some shred of respectability, which I sincerely don't believe that they deserve. All right, last thing I want to say about this. I'm not claiming that we shouldn't listen to the arguments of Grand Priest. I'm not saying that we should close our ears when we hear people claim that contradictions exist. Quite the contrary. We should certainly listen, listen to them because it helps us understand the use of language better. It helps us understand how people become confused. It helps us understand the profundity of logic, which is essential for creating a rational worldview, is to just fully grasp how incredibly profound the nature of logic is. That we can understand the most fundamental rules of all existence is an incredible phenomena. And by grappling with the dialetheist arguments, it helps you gain a deeper appreciation for that. So I'm not saying we should laugh them out of existence prior to hearing their argument. I'm just saying that you can ultimately know beforehand that their argument is flawed by virtue of the fact that they do the one thing that you're not allowed to do in intellectual discourse, which is explicitly contradict yourself and think that that's okay. Okay, so I ask him then about the liar's paradox, which is, as I've said many times, arguably the most popular paradox that comes up when talking about these issues. People try to claim the existence of true contradictions. It is ultimately inevitable that the liar's paradox comes up. The liar's paradox is simply, this sentence is false. There's many variations of it, but that's kind of the one that I like. So what he says is, look, you can resolve the liar's paradox simply by understanding language better. The resolution isn't something that there's a contradiction in reality. It's just, look, you're using language in a way that we actually can't use it, though at first glance it appears you can. I agree with this. The liar's paradox tell us some, tells us something about language. doesn't tell us something about reality. But the dialetheists do something else. What the dialetheists do is, rather than making their revisions at the level of how we handle language, they, they revise the very basic logic, which is a logic that is used in all theorizing whatsoever. Yes. So, for example, all over the, the natural sciences and in mathematics, people are, are using logical principles. I mean, they're, they're, they're reasoning with logic because when they come to an inconsistency, then they, avoid, then they do something to get out of it and, and so on. And... Um, and so what, what the dialetheists are doing is, is forcing us to, to complicate fundamentally all the reasoning that we, that we do because yes. they say that absolutely basic uh, laws of, of logic have to be revised. Whereas it, um, if, if you go the classical way, you can, you can just keep the standard laws of logic. They don't need to be revised at all. And so we don't need to mess with normal mathematics and normal physics and so on. We, all, all we need to mess with are the principles that we use in reasoning about language, about, about the way that we apply the concepts of truth and falsity to sentences. Okay, so I have two things to say about this. So I kind of like the way that he's framing what's going on here, right? We had the classical route is to say, okay, the liar's paradox has to do with language. The dialetheist route has to do, they say, oh, no, it actually says something about reality. Here's my analogy I like to give. It's as if somebody has written down on a piece of paper, 2 plus 2 equals 5. And they say, oh my gosh, we have a contradiction, 2 plus 2 equals 5, and therefore, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, they say reality is contradictory, 
and we know that because 2 plus 2 equals 5, and so on. They build their worldview off of their little formula, 2 plus 2 equals 5. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, hang on, hang on. I think you've actually made a relatively simple error here. 2 plus 2 equals 4. It doesn't equal 5. I realize that you've written that down, and it, maybe it looks like 2 plus 2 equals 5 because you put it in a formula, but you've just made a very elementary error. So not only is that error wrong, but all of your conclusions, your very, very dramatic conclusions, which have followed from 2 plus 2 equaling 5, all of those things are mistaken. You don't need to go there. All you need to do is take an eraser and understand you've made a very simple mistake. That's essentially what's going on with the liar's paradox. Look, you've just wrote down this sentence is false. You don't realize the nature of language, its relationship to reality, which you can and cannot do with words, the concepts of truth and falsehood. And they take this error and they go, oh my gosh, reality is contradictory. We have proof of it. We can't know anything. Our mind is flawed, blah, 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 blah. I think that's ultimately what's going on here. But what I disagree with is this idea that it's somehow respectable that, oh, you, it could be 2 plus 2 equals 5. It could be 2 plus 2 equals 4. Or maybe the dialetheists are right. Maybe they're wrong. We can't be so arrogant as to just dismiss the idea that 2 plus 2 equals 5 or that there are contradictions in reality because of the liar's paradox. What I'd say is no. 2 plus 2 equals 5, i.e. the liar's paradox, is an elementary fundamental error that stems from a confusion about existence, a confusion about language, or maybe a confusion about mathematics. It is juvenile, naive, silly, embarrassing, anti-intellectual to think that you can create all these radical conclusions based on such an elementary error. Okay, so the other thing I want to say about this is something that has so far been universal in all of my conversing with professional academics, and indeed a lot of people in the general public, and it has to do with what I'll not so nicely call a groupthink mentality. Even in the way that we're talking about something like logic, they'll say, well, Classical logic is used in physics, and it's used in mathematics, and it's used in chemistry, and it's used in all these areas of thought. Therefore, we probably shouldn't throw it out because we use it everywhere else. This reminds me a little bit of the conversation I was having with Dr. Westacott when I started this series, where it's kind of this communal search for the truth, that people are making progress here, so we have to respect that they're making progress, they're using th something, and if all these different people are using the same thing, gosh, that probably means that that thing is true. I completely reject this. I think it's totally wrong. I don't think that the pursuit of truth should be a communal thing. It needs to be an individual thing. And it doesn't really matter if everybody is using classical logic in all these different areas. I mean, that's nice. If you understand what logic is, you'll understand why that's the case. It's because those are the inescapable rules of all existence. So, of course, you would see the application of classical logical rules in all these different areas of thought, at least the sensible ones, but that doesn't give it any more plausibility than what it has by itself. If nobody ever had discovered classical logic, and if everybody was using some kind of mystical, logically contradictory way to arrive at their conclusions, it would make no difference in the matter whatsoever. Those people who are the mystics who believe that A and not A is true, they're wrong. Even if it's the entire field of academia or the entire group of religious leaders and churches and your entire community, to the extent they use a flawed methodology, they're wrong. It doesn't matter how many of them do so. And if there's only one person, if you're the only person who has discovered the inescapable rules of existence, you're right. You have discovered something which is certainly true, and you can say from your perspective that everybody else is wrong. Now, if you take kind of the more groupthink mentality, you're not allowed to do that. You can't say, oh, well, I'm the one person that's right, everybody else is wrong. You have to say, oh, well, everybody else is probably right, and therefore I'm probably wrong. If you've read any of my other work, you know this is very consistent with my discoveries of the mainstream conclusions of academicians. Not only do I think it's methodologically flawed to take a groupthink perspective, I think in practice it is demonstrably flawed that you get these ridiculous ideas like the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, you get dialetheism, you get Keynesian economics, you get all kinds of catastrophically flawed ideas that are arrived at by large groups of supposed intellectuals. My kind of lone wolf solo philosopher approach, I think, is a much more accurate method of discovering truth than the alternatives. It might not be as popular. People might think that you're a jerk or crazy or something like that. But I am convinced that it is a more accurate way of careful reasoning and building a logical worldview than being very sympathetic and kind of giving default respect to anybody or any group's idea just because they happen to believe a certain thing. 
even if that thing is self-evidently, explicitly, logically contradictory. So I kind of indirectly told Dr. Williamson that that's my idea, that these ideas really aren't even respectable. The term that I use, I think accurately so, is coherent. My point is to say that not only are these ideas really not respectable, they're not even coherent. They don't even make sense. And this was his response. It's too extreme to suggest that, that dialetheism involves total intellectual anarchy where just anything goes. I mean, dialetheists, they do have some principles of logic that they adhere to. Uh, and you know, if you that talk... That they don't contradict? They, it's not that they have avoid contradictions, but there are various other principles that, that they adhere to. So um, you know, there is some discipline to the way that somebody like Graham Priest talks. There is discipline. I think certainly that is the case in the sense that they sit down and write books and, and formally try to develop a theory. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, um, can it be that a theory is internally coherent if it's not internally consistent? Can you, have co like, can, can you say, yes, I fully understand this subject matter, even though within my understanding there's a contradiction? Well, of course, I think it's, I think it's, it's wrong to say that because it, there are no true contradictions right. on, my, on my view. But um, if, if by incoherent you mean something like a, a theory that just totally collapses, then that is not the case for dialetheist theories. So again, I, I just have to disagree here. I mean, what I would say is what we mean by a theory collapsing is a discovery of a logical contradiction. It's not even an empirical question if whether or not you can have a some worldview or proposition that might be respectable and contradictory. It's that the criteria of judging whether or not an idea is consistent, respectable, or collapses on itself is whether or not it meets the first requirement, which is not to be logically contradictory. Okay, so that's enough about dialetheism. I want to talk about two more things. One is very quick. I've mentioned before on this podcast and in my writing that I think a great cause of what I call irrationalism, that is the acceptance of logical contradictions into your worldview and whatnot, comes from, of all places, mathematics. The treatment of infinities in mathematics, our understanding of the metaphysics of mathematics, largely stemming from the work around the turn of the 20th century in the foundations of mathematics. I think that modern math is based on inaccurate foundations. And what's interesting is that in this conversation about talking about irrationalism, talking about logic, Dr. Williamson brings up the fact that we had to really revise our thinking around the turn of the 20th century with the work of George Cantor in set theories in his supposed treatment of infinities. So listen to this exchange. Well, the case of infinity that you mentioned before, is that's a case where um, we've developed theories or Cantor developed theories which have become a part of absolutely standard mathematics. Uh, which do contradict things that people regarded as self-evident before. I mean, for example, that it, in some sense, the the a, a part of a thing a, a, um, can be the same size as the whole thing, and um, and and so you know we've we've had to to revise our ideas about what's really obvious. Well, why wouldn't you conclude then that Cantor was wrong? Well, I think the um, the, the success of um, of modern mathematics is 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 pretty clear indication that that Cantor was was not uh, uh, on the uh, the wrong track. Well, what do you mean by success? Well, it's um, but both its its role in um, you know, providing the mathematical framework for the the, the rest of science and uh, it's uh, it, it's never uh, Cantor's. Uh, set theory, when, once it's rigorously developed, does not involve any contradictions. I mean, certainly nobody's ever found any contradictions. Even in something of, like a part being the same size as the whole, you'd say is not a contradiction. There's no, there's no contradiction there because it's not, it's not of the, the form something is the case and it's not the case. And there you have it. I mean, Dr. Williamson is somebody that I seem to agree with on a vast majority of things as it relates to logic, 
But his position is, oh, well, you that we have finite logic, and then we have infinite logic. And infinite logic is this amazing thing that plays by different rules. And, and when in the infinite world, you can have a whole be the same size as one of the parts of the whole. And what I would say is, no, you can't. When you understand the meaning of the term part and the meaning of the term whole, it is certainly not the case that the whole can somehow be the same size as the part. The response is, oh, well, it's just counterintuitive. That's the way it works, right? I ask him, well, why would you conclude Cantor was wrong? And his response is the universal response in academia, and that's, well, mathematics has been very successful. Six, but successful, of course, by their own metric, because you don't need infinities in mathematics. You don't need infinities in physics. You have the finitist school of, you have several finitist schools of mathematics that make absolutely no use of infinity and yet still get the job done. But for whatever historical quirk of a reason, Cantor's counterintuitive work still finds itself at the bottom of modern mathematics. But that's a good transition to talk about what I thought was really, really interesting in this conversation. We start talking about the metaphysics of concepts, metaphysics of numbers. My position is something like this, that numbers are not something that's out there in the ether. They don't exist in some non-spatial world separate of our conception of them. To the extent they exist, they're ideas, they're concepts. The number seven isn't some entity that's floating out there. Seven is a concept. It's like the term several. You can't have several that's just floating out in the ether. Several is just a concept. It's just an idea. So here's his first response. There are ideas and there are what the ideas are of. And um, I mean, there's, there's the number one and there's a the concept of the number one, but those are, those are the distinct. I don't think thing. they are. I think that's, that is the presupposition of Platonism, that one is out there, separate of our conception of it. And I don't think that makes sense. Okay, so that's the central issue. And I, I, you hear this all the time when talking about the foundations and the, the metaphysics of mathematics. People say there's the concept of one and then there is one, just like there's the concept of a horse and there is the horse itself. But my position is sometimes the concepts don't have an external referent. Sometimes the concept or the idea is the whole thing. Here's the example I love to give. The analogy I use, just, you know, we're in England, is Harry Potter, right? Does, what is the, the ontological status of Harry Potter? Well, if nobody conceived of him, he would have no existence. He has no, no existence out there. And to the extent he exists, it's only as a product of people thinking, but J.K. Rowling sitting down and writing you know, thinking about him. He exists in the conceptual world. We can say things like Harry Potter has circular glasses. Yeah, that's a true statement. But we have to bracket it and say in terms of the mental world. If nobody can ever conceived of him, that wouldn't, that wouldn't even make sense. The same is true, I think, of numbers. Numbers have the exact same type of existence as fictional characters. They, they do not exist when we're not thinking about them. Okay, so that's my position. Listen very carefully to his response. But there's, a, there's a, a difference because it would be ridiculous to try to use the fictional character of Harry Potter to explain what happened a million years ago before J.K. Rowling uh, ever wrote the books. But in the case of mathematics, we, we use numbers in doing physics, but, and we use them to explain yeah. events that happened millions of years yes, ago. Yes, but these aren't arbitrary concepts. I would say they're conceptual, but their grounding is in logic. One is a, it's a logical concept. Amount, quantity, is something that is a logical concept that can have an actual direct reference to existent phenomena in reality. So if I say there's one you know, microphone here, that means something very, very concrete that we can, we can, and we can abstract from it. So we can say, oneness is nice to think about in the abstract. You can apply it to all sorts of different areas, even a million years in the past, but it doesn't exist when it's not being conceived of. It's a conceptual, logical tool. Okay, so his point is to say, look, we can use mathematics to talk about astronomical events that happened a million years ago. We can't use Harry Potter to do the same thing. Therefore, Harry Potter and numbers have some different type of metaphysical existence. Some conceptions, some ideas have external reference. When I'm talking about my feet, I have the concept of my feet and I have actual feet. But some things do not have external reference. So when I'm talking about Harry Potter or Pegasus, these things don't actually relate to anything in physical reality. They're just concepts. They're just ideas. Those things have an existence which is entirely consumed by our conception of them, which is not the case with my feet. If nobody were to ever conceive of my feet, 
they would still exist. If nobody were to ever conceive of Harry Potter or Pegasus, those things, by their nature, wouldn't exist. I claim this is also the case with numbers. If nobody were to conceive of four, four wouldn't have any type of existence. However, as a concept, it can certainly relate to reality. You can have four of this or four of that. But this conception isn't just totally capricious like making up a fictional character is. Let me give you an example. Take the sentence, everything that exists, exists. Okay, so that sentence is something that would not have existed if I didn't just create it, right? The words don't exist out there in the ether. I have created a sentence. But that sentence re applies to everything in reality, not just in the present, but also in the future and in the past. So I've come up with a concept, but th the nature of that concept is such that it is logically certainly applicable to every feature of reality at all times. This is true with mathematics. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a formula that I've come up with in my mind, yes, but if you actually understand the meaning of the concepts, that formula applies at all times in the future, in the present, and in the past. So sometimes our concepts are some things that don't have reference. Sometimes our concepts do have reference. Sometimes our concepts are capricious. Sometimes our concepts are logical. But I don't see the need for positing the existence of an entity that is the number four that is somehow separate of our conception of it. Just like I see no need to posit the entity of Harry Potter outside of our conception of him. Or the entity of the sentence, everything is a thing, outside of our conception of that sentence. So what do you think about the existence of, uh, of when we're talking about Harry Potter? Does, does he exist? There's a fictional character, Harry Potter, who is, cre that is, not, a per is not a boy, but uh, is a kind of cultural construct that was created by J.K. Rowling. Yes. What is its existence? Where if nobody would have thought of that construction, well, it, it, then it would have existence. been uh, a, a merely possible fictional character. What is the status of a possible fictional character? What is the actual status of one? Is it existent or not? Depends what you mean by existent, but it's, it's, it's self-identical. Yeah, but it's not. It wouldn't be anything. It, 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 would, be, it would be something. It would be a, a, possi so, a possible fictional character. So, that's something. So, so, so would you say that all possible fictional characters have existence? Have some type of in existence? A, in a... In a uh, a thin logical sense of existence, yes. So this kind of took me off guard, and I'll just keep playing this particular exchange a little bit because I thought it was so remarkable. It was such a clear difference between the, the ways in which we're thinking about these things. So the, the, the books that are written a million years from now with characters that we know nothing of, they have some type of existence to them. Yes, but you have to understand that, that existence doesn't have to be in space and time. So you say, you, you think that future concepts that have never been conceived have a non-spatial existence, all future concepts. Yes. Now, if you're listening to this and you're as surprised as I am, do leave a comment or send me an email or something. Is it the case that this doesn't strike other people as completely nuts to think that future concepts that have not been conceived and won't be conceived for a thousand years have an actual existence prior to their conception? I just think this is so muddled and incorrect, and it posits so many additional entities that exist that I, have see, I see no reason to see they exist. It seems much more streamlined to say concepts don't exist until they've been conceived, and they do not exist after they've been conceived by their nature. A thousand years from now, somebody reads the Harry Potter books, and they misread them, and they think Harry Potter has square glasses. That concept of Harry Potter with square glasses that nobody would ever have thought about prior to that conception of it, even if it's 10,000 years, and take any misreadings of Harry Potter, that particular concept with one little, the shoelace is tied differently, that still has a real non-spatial existence. A misreading is something that happens, and that was, it was a possible misreading all along. It was a possible misreading all along. I think there was a bit of a miscommunication because my point isn't to say that the misreading happened, although he even said it was a possible misreading. I don't think I agree with that. But my point is to say that concept that somebody gets after the misreading, so they read something, it sparks a concept in their head of Harry Potter with square glasses or the, the, the shoelaces tied differently, whatever, that concept that sparked in the head after the misreading has some type of real existence prior to the misreading. 
And he says yes. Okay, so just listen to this final exchange. So that is one theory, but don't, wouldn't you find it much more uh, persuasive or, or comfortable to say it is not the case that all possible concepts have any type of existence, that concepts do not exist prior to their conception and they do not exist after their conception. They are entirely dependent on our active conceptualization of them. Yeah, but if, if you're saying there are some concepts that don't exist, is that, is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying at the, at the point of conception, co that concept exists. So, so it's like um, uh, there is no concept which exists separate of it being conceived. That's what I'm saying. By virtue of what we mean by a concept, I would say. No, I don't think, I think that's, that's not, not right. I mean, it, a concept is something that, can, that um, is a way, uh, it's a way of conceiving something. Like the concept, the, the concept of, uh, of London, let's say, it, I mean, it's a, a way of thinking of London. I yes, suppose. but there's no and, ways of thinking of London without the mind, right? So you wouldn't have the concept of London without thinking of London. It was still there was a, as it were, the notional possibility of thinking of London uh, was there all along. In a real metaphysical way, has some type of real existence. Yes. So I think that metaphysical idea posits the existence of a heck of a lot more metaphysical entities that than I am comfortable positing. Namely, every single concept that anybody has conceived from the beginning of time until forever has a real existence independent of our conception. Those concepts which are never conceived have some type of real existence that is never realized. So that's one theory, or it might be the case that concepts by their nature have a dependent metaphysical existence. There is no such thing as a concept prior to its conception or a concept after its conception. That seems to cut down the number of entities in the world by some unfathomably large number. And I don't see what explanatory power gets lost in the process. But that's all I wanted to talk about today. I've got a lot more to say on this topic. I hope you enjoyed the interview breakdown. And if for some reason you didn't get a chance to listen to this whole interview, make sure you go back and listen to it because it really is one of the favorite conversations I've had with anybody so far. And I have a great deal of respect for Dr. Williamson. I've got a lot of exciting other things coming up. My wife and I are resuming some of our travels in the States. We are heading to California tomorrow. Then we're going up to Canada, then we're going to Michigan, then we're going to Boston. So hopefully in the next month or so, I'm going to be getting interviews at every, everywhere from Stanford to Berkeley and uh, Harvard. So a lot of really cool things coming up. Make sure to stay tuned. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. <laughs>